Well, first of all, thank you all very much for being here. This is a much bigger crowd than I anticipated. I was hoping this would be the kind of crowd that we would get, but not 100% guaranteed that, that was going to happen. Um, like uh, Dr. Janice said, this is also the first um, real in-person event that we have had. We did a couple of these on Zoom, which I know some of you attended. Um, Zoom is, um, it kind of works, right? But it's not really the, the best possible um, thing for conveying some of this information. Um, so yeah, this really great to have all of you here today. Um, really appreciate you all taking the time to uh, show up. Um, this is also the first time I've ever had ever actually uh, publicly shared anything from my uh, PhD work. Um, it's just been me and my advisor kind of uh, whittling this thing down slowly but surely um, over emails and over Skype calls one-on-one um, -on -one, um, and yeah finally get into a position to actually share some of this stuff um, I think is uh, uh, good. Um, yeah so thanks uh, for uh, everyone being here let's uh, kind of jump into some of this and see uh, what my overall uh, argument is for this particular aspect of the project. Um, generally speaking though, um, what I'm looking at is the ideology, the ideas that are used to justify the use of force and specifically the use of force via military technologies and all of the super advanced military technologies that we have today and how all of this rhetoric is kind of bundled up and used to sell these projects and these ideas to the American public specifically um, and then also the wider world when those technologies are actually employed um, in different places in different countries to achieve um, certain objectives. Um, so we'll dive into this with the um, kind of the, the opening question of who is Julian Assange and what is WikiLeaks. Um, some of you have probably heard of Julian Assange as an individual and WikiLeaks as an organization. Some of you probably have not. Um, there's uh, some interesting reasons for this, which we will explore. Um, but Assange, he's an Australian publisher, and what he specializes in publishing are leaked government documents. Documents that are classified or secretive um, for whatever reason, um, usually under the national security banner, which we'll look at in a second. Um, but the idea of publishing these documents is not just to publicize them, to get them out into the public for no reason at all. The idea is to reveal some degree of wrongdoing that has taken place. Something that the government has done um, that it does not necessarily want complete public scrutiny over or would prefer to have public scrutiny in a very set of um, a kind of a strict set of limits for that debate um, limits which we will also explore here so he establishes wikileaks specifically as an organization to really uh, bring these um, people together these whistleblowers that leak this information um, and to use it as a platform that can then spread all of these findings um, around the world and get them into a global public conversation. Um, this begins in 2006, and there's a little bit of traction here and there, but there's not a there's not kind of a massive groundswell of public conversation about Assange and WikiLeaks. That happens in 2010. In 2010, we get the emergence of Chelsea, then Bradley Manning, um, coming forward and bringing to Assange and WikiLeaks literally hundreds of thousands of secret documents from within the US military. Why could Manning do this? Because Manning was employed as an intelligence analyst. So he had lots of insider access to everything that was going on um, with um, the inner workings of the US military. There are three big sets of leaks that Manning brings to us, um, the Iraq war logs, the Afghan war logs, and Cablegate. And again, we're talking literally hundreds of thousands of pages of documents um, that comes out of all of this. Um, and they're showing the inner workings of the American military, specifically in Iraq and Afghanistan in those first two cases. Um, and then Cablegate is an interesting one. Um, it's a big trove of cables or communications between official US government um, outposts around the world. 
And what comes out of Cablegate is some particularly embarrassing stuff. Um, we see that the US is exposed to be conducting espionage on allies, um, talking very negatively, to say the least, about allies um, behind closed doors and privately. Um, but publicly, of course, um, has a very different view of all these different things, a very different view of how Iraq is being um, conducted as a war in Afghanistan and how relations between these different countries um, should be conducted um, in this kind of public setting, very different to the, the private revelations that we get here. Now, the really big thing that projects WikiLeaks into the global consciousness is a video that WikiLeaks brands collateral murder. Any of you guys heard of this before? A couple of you, not too many. Um, this is a, a long video, which we won't uh, watch here, um, but it's about um, somewhere in here. It's about 40 something minutes long. Um, and it shows uh, an, um, an Apache attack helicopter attack um, in Iraq, which ends up killing a lot of civilians. Um, and it's also edited in a way um, that makes it really show the reality of war and conflict and what it actually means on the ground. Um, so today, he's being prosecuted, Assange that is, by the US government, and um, they, they are currently trying to extradite him from the UK. And he's had a very interesting experience in the UK where he was essentially um, stuck in the Ecuadorian embassy for a number of years um, trying to avoid um, this prosecution and avoid these extradition processes, which is an interesting story that unfortunately we don't have time to go in here, but you might want to look into it. Um, so a big question I think that we need to look at first before we get into um, this as a, a more general issue is why would you study this as a problem? Why would you bother dedicating your time, attention, um, efforts to looking at a topic like this. I come from the world view that political science should respond to real world problems. Um, it should not really be concerned with what we might deem official problems um, or what government officials tell us are the, are the issues of the day. We should actually determine that for ourselves, use our own critical thinking, our own faculties to, to figure out what's going on here and why we should care about it. Then this position, this idea of a methodological position for political science really comes from C. Wright Mills. He writes a text as a lot of my individual students will know, the power elites, which you guys uh, study in my classes. Um, but also he writes something called the sociological imagination, which is a methodological text on what social sciences should be doing. And he says it should res um, respond to urgent public issues and insistent human troubles, which in my opinion is what WikiLeaks and Assange um, have exposed to the world, um, urgent public issues and insistent human troubles. Um, this here is a still image from the collateral murder video. Um, shows a van that's responding to the initial attack. An uh, individual gets out, tries to assist with the injured. He too ends up being engaged and there are also children uh, in that van as it is hit. Um, so yeah, this is um, a very serious issue that I think deserves attention, deserves study. Um, so the aim overall, changing negative social conditions, revealing structures that limit human freedom and expose the myths that maintain some degree of oppression. Um, I think that's what we should aim for in the social sciences. Um, as students, you're learning about these things and faculty in terms of, well, let's, let's apply our knowledge to actually some positive change in the world. I think that would be useful. So I want to give kind of a, a theoretical or conceptual basis um, for my ideas on this topic and then we'll actually delve into the uh, the content of the, um, this particular case the power of ideas this is something that is given a degree of attention in the study of politics um, but not necessarily the degree of attention that the power of economics or military force gets um, ideas um, they also matter and they can very much change what um, does or does not happen in the world. Um, really two different ways that ideas have influence. Instrumental in that they can actually change minds so you can actually go from thinking one thing to thinking something else as a result of a change in ideas and they can also legitimize policy choices and that's specifically the aspect that I focus on here with this particular study. 
how are ideas used to justify the use of military force in this particular case. Once we have our set of ideas, um, well, political actors, um, they will pursue these as they internalize them and they'll come out as norms and values. So we'll do certain things and value certain things as a result of the ideas that we collectively share. Um, there's one particular theorist, um, Antonio Gramsci, who really delves into the importance of ideas in politics. Um, and he's really making the case that if you want social control, um, this has to go beyond force. It can't just be at the barrel of a gun. Um, it has to also be with ideas. If you have people that agree with your ideas and consent to what you're doing in the world, it makes it far easier for you to actually maintain um, control, maintain um, consent. Um, so it becomes this fusion of both consent and coercion. Um, together, what do these ideas then give us? They give us a consensus on problems and expectations. We believe this, therefore this should happen. <clears throat> the case of WikiLeaks, as we'll look at, um, I argue that we should get this, right? That's what we're being told, but we don't actually get it. We get something vastly different, um, as we shall see. Um, and yeah, overall, what do ideas then do? They limit options. They limit what is permissible um, in a given society, in a given system, um, what we can and cannot do. So what are the ideas of American foreign policy? What does American foreign policy seek to achieve? Um, well, this really has its roots in the era immediately after World War II. Um, we get the pursuit of this enlightened, capitalist, democratic order. Um, and importantly, it's an order that is claimed that it can actually convert other races, cultures, behaviours to this way of thinking, that this is the best way of thinking and the best way of organising a society. Um, and if not, it has the means to repress those groups that do not want to go along with this. This comes to be called liberal hegemony or democratic peace theory. And the overall idea is that if all nations are brought together and converted <coughs> into democracies, well, all nations will then get along with one another. They'll all be able to talk to one another, resolve their differences this way. They won't fight with one another. <coughs> well, this has an interesting kind of counterpoint, um, which comes from this. It's, it's insisting that there is a unanimity on these principles. Democracy, market um, values, um, specifically the, the idea of free market um, and globalization. It's insisting that these are universal values, that you can actually apply these everywhere in the world to all cultures, all people, um, all races, um, that all of them are actually gonna be um, amenable to shifting in this direction. The question becomes, is that actually possible? Um, well, some of the problems um, would say no, that that's, that's not always possible. There are certain places, certain people, um, certain cultures that are just not necessarily going to line up with the democratic, free market, globalized order. It's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. That's just how it is. Um, this particular idea, though, it's obscuring something important. It's obscuring that these ideas, they come from really elite power centers. They come from groups of individuals um, within the political world um, that do not necessarily have the same interests and goals as all of us would have. They can have somewhat different goals and ideas about what um, should happen and what should be on the um, agenda to be achieved. Um, and specifically what it obscures are these distinctions, right? Um, social, political, racial, and class processes. Um, these are not all necessarily going to align with this stuff. <clears throat> and something it does, particularly in the United States, is it exploits patriotism and nationalism um, to justify the, the imposition of this order. Um, and it's going to do this by using a moralistic rhetoric. So this is the right thing to do. This is the right direction to go in. These are the right ideas that should be applied. Um, and if need be, we can therefore support violent interventions 
to impose these ideas where they need to be applied um, because they are the best ideas and that's really um, the position that they fall into um, in these elite power centers. Well, the next question then is, well, how do we actually see these ideas being applied in the real world? Um, we've defined the ideology of American foreign policy. Well, how is it actually implemented? Um, in many ways, it comes across in caricatures, cliches, and oversimplifications. Um, the war on terror being really an exceptional example of this. Um, freedom fries. Some of you may remember this problem, right? So we can't call French fries French fries anymore because the French don't want to support the war on terror. They've got to become freedom fries. Um, big oversimplification. Axis of evil, something else that emerges out of the war on terror. Um, there was um, another incident in the Trump presidency where they they um, sanctioned a number of Iranian officials equal to the number of American hostages that were held in Iran like 40 years ago. So there's lots of stuff going on here which is, really isn't um, based in reality. It's not based on um, anything that's useful to actually solving real problems. <clears throat> and this also leads to this. There is a big gap between what political elites want, political insiders want, versus what the public actually wants. Um, and this has some kind of nasty consequences, and this being one of them. Um, this use of a, a military definition of reality, if you're not with us, you're with the terrorists, all of this sort of rhetoric, right, which again comes out of the war on terror, um, this weakens democracy because it's relying consistently on threats and opportunities abroad. We must do this. We must act now. We can't have debate. There can't be discussion. We've just got to take this action. We've got to do it now because it's an emergency. End of the world if we don't do this. Well, maybe, but um, could we also perhaps compare and contrast some other ideas, some other options? Perhaps there are other options. We're just not thinking them through or not giving them enough time. So then how does this all roll out in the world, both in secret and in public? Um, in secret, we get this kind of cover up of the true intentions of um, American foreign policy. Covert operations, use of CIA, these sorts of institutions, NSA, NRO, um, all these different institutions, these different government departments um, that really hide the use of violence to a great degree. Um, violence, as we shall see, very intimately involved um, in the maintenance of this system of American foreign policy. Publicly though, we get this, an energetic legitimization of militarism, and it's all revolving around this idea of a principled crusade. We're doing this because we have the right ideas, we have the right principles, we're applying them to places that do not have these ideas, um, but they should be grateful for it. Right? They, they should want this stuff because they are universal ideas. This is the position that's given. Well, the big way in which these ideas are then um, applied is, like I've been alluding to, the use of military force, uh, specifically technological military force. And there's a few uh, points on here that we could quickly mention, and then I'll get into um, the charges against Assange and how this all plays out in that particular case. Um, in the 1990s, there's what's called a revolution in military affairs, a uh, big claim coming about that new technology means that there will be um, faster victories, more accuracy, less destruction. All of these um, sorts of technologies are friendly little predator drone up here um, with these nice little Hellfire missile ready to go. Um, this means um, faster victory, more accuracy, less destruction, because this will just be used um, versus the targets that it needs to hit. It will not result in collateral damage. It will not result in the um, mass civilian deaths. Um, this is a position that Senator John Warner was particularly um, involved in pushing, um, making this case that it's gonna lead to less casualties, this high tech push towards um, really acquiring and deploying all of these new technologies. And also interestingly, more recruits because individuals would be really excited about the prospect of being able to join a military and get their hands on all of this high-tech gear and all this high-tech equipment and be able to use it um, and deploy it around the world. Um, 
So overall, we get a moralistic veneer which emerges on the use of force. Um, now we can use force and we can use it more effectively and we can use it more morally and justly thanks to the technologies that we now have access to. Um, this has led to a continued growth in spending on military force in the United States, which is now over $800 billion every year. $800 billion. Um, so if um, you're ever wondering if the government has enough money to do something, uh, yes they do. Um, it's possible that it's just being funneled in this direction. Um, the problem, does this actually work, this technology? And does it actually change anything about war? Um, many examples which WikiLeaks looks at and examines would say um, no. And there's some interesting studies that even came out in the, in the 70s and the 80s which said military technology is moving in a direction that is becoming more and more and more complicated, more and more complex, which means it costs more and more and more money, but you're getting less and less and less in terms of actual benefits from these changes and all of this money that's being spent. Um, so overall, lots of issues and problems here. So now the question is, right, and let's return to Assange. What is the US government saying about Julian Assange and why specifically um, do I think this is not accurate? Um, that what's going on here is something very different. And that's the, these claims as we shall examine, they're kind of all revolving around this idea of national security. Um, but in actual fact, I'll make the case that Julian Assange and the reason that he's being targeted is the fact that those revelations directly threaten these justifications, the application of these ideas to this use of military force. So these are the legal charges. First, they come in 2018, conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. These, docu these documents, it claims, are classified to prevent serious damage to national security. Um, the information so obtained could be used to the injury of the United States and the advantage of any foreign nation. Um, notice the, the framing here, the injury of the United States. Um, it's trying to ensure that this moralistic um, veneer is still applied to the US in this particular case. In 2019, the charges are escalated. Um, conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defense information, um, a violation of the Espionage Act. And this is what that particular indictment says. Assange designed WikiLeaks to focus on information restricted from public disclosure by law precisely because of the value of that information. WikiLeaks' disclosures of this, of this information would allow enemy forces to anticipate certain actions or responses and to carry out more effective attacks. Um, so that's the value that the US government is saying this information has, that it exposes American military forces um, and allows them to be attacked. Um, I'm making the case that the value in this information is actually in that it is calling into question the very basis of these military attacks in the first place, um, the, the use of force um, in these different places around the world. So let's go through these three points. I've got three key critiques of the American government's case. Um, the first one is generally um, against these ideas of American policy, um, the ideas that are used to justify these decisions. The second is that WikiLeaks helps to establish an anti-war movement or a group of people that might offer a different ideology, a different way of thinking about foreign policy. And third, that these revelations really call into question that military industrial complex spending $800 billion a year on these supposedly high tech systems, um, which in actual fact don't meet their promised realities when it comes to their deployment on the battlefield. So we'll return here to this collateral murder clip. Um, these are some steals from that uh, video. Kind of blurry, can't really see what's going on, um, but that is the point. Um, we see this guy down here peering around a corner and holding something. Anyone want to take a guess at what that might be? Um, camera. Camera. Anyone else? A weapon. A weapon. It was a camera. <laughs> um, Chris, you may have seen this one before. <laughs> yeah, very disturbing. Yeah. Um, so here, the point is though, right, when you're kind of in the moment, you can't necessarily tell what that is. Um, so should you engage? That kind of becomes the question. Um, so this, this uh, video, collateral murder, 39 minutes. 
um, we're looking at 12 to 20 people that are killed, including children in that van, in that opening slide. Um, and journalists from Reuters. So, so Reuters, by no means a small organization. We're talking one of the biggest journalistic organizations in the world, Reuters. Um, and yeah, two of their journalists, two of their employees killed um, in this attack. So remember the, the American case against this. Um, this is allowing enemy forces to attack could injure the United States by revealing this sort of information. Well, we get something different <clears throat> from uh, those directly involved in it and those that um, leaked it. So Assange calls this leak specifically an exercise in moral clarity, um, a disclosure of abuse. Um, Ethan McCord, he's one of the soldiers that actually responded to this situation on the ground. So after this all takes place, um, there's a squad that moves in, um, soldiers dismount and they try to figure out what the hell has just happened. Um, a couple of them, Ethan McCord being one, um, come to um, some stark realizations. It was at that point I realized what we were doing is wrong. <clears throat> um, because as we shall see, the, uh, the devastation on the ground is uh, quite dramatic. <clears throat> the children being killed, this is reported over the radio to the pilots who are still in the air circling. Um, one of them, well, it's their fault for bringing their kids into a battle. Um, so what we see ultimately is that the moral, justifiable use of national security rhetoric um, crumbles when it's actually applied to these real situations. Um, the human devastation becomes very far removed from the stated objectives um, of what actually happens here. Um, the official responses to this particular leak are interesting. Um, and they all kind of point in one direction. Hillary Clinton says that she condemned it in the most clear terms the she condemned in the most clear terms the disclosure of any information by individuals and or organizations which puts the lives of United States and its partners, service members and civilians at risk. Obama, if I was to release stuff, information that I'm not authorized to release, I'm breaking the law. We're a nation of laws. <clears throat> Robert Gates, then defense secretary um, under Bush and Obama. The video doesn't show the broader picture of the firing that was going on at American troops. Um, the broader picture that I argue he's alluding to is actually the, the idealistic rhetoric of uh, American foreign policy, right? So what we're doing here is right in a broad sense of things. Um, this might be a small exception to that, but broadly speaking, we're still in the right. We're still doing the right thing. We're still moving in the right direction. Josh Deber, he's the other soldier who comes out publicly against this, another um, soldier who responded on the ground. Um, he says, this is a system that is training people to act in a certain way and putting them in situations where they feel that they have to do this kind of thing. All of this exposes so clearly the fallacy of using war as a tool of foreign policy to, to supposedly spread freedom and democracy around the world. Um, and Assange would make the claim that there is nothing in this material that threatens U.S. national security. Um, and in fact, the case that, again, I'm making here is kind of alluding to this point, um, that this is calling this idea into question. Is this spreading freedom and democracy? Um, probably not. Second case, <clears throat> legitimizing an anti-war movement. So this is important when it comes to ideas. If we return to our point that ideas matter and ideas determine what sort of direction a country goes in, the decision that it makes, what is or is not acceptable, well, a new set of ideas might mean that there's a new set of things that are acceptable or are not acceptable. Um, and it can be these sorts of movements, <coughs> these sorts of social um, networks that can push a shift in ideas that can be quite dramatic. So WikiLeaks is specifically engaged in what we call electronic activism. They've been called e-bandits, hacktivists, all this type of stuff. Um, and it's really internet-based civil disobedience. We wouldn't really call this cyber terrorism. More civil disobedience, more along those lines. It's not um, trying to destroy anything physically. It's trying to make a point that something is illegitimate and should change as a result. 
Um, there are also efforts that shift into the real world as well. So what can happen in the cyberspace can shift into empirical reality out here uh, on the streets. Um, and that can then impact um, certain power centers. How does it do this? It develops a global communication network, a global group of people that were united in support of its cause. Um, and there are a number of groups here, as you can see, which are kind of wide ranging. We have journalists, human rights activists, technical experts, and even people that generally may have been uninterested um, in street protest. Um, they don't really want to go out and yell at people on the street, they don't want to hold banners, things like this. But they're totally fine sitting behind a computer and doing something. So this means that we have a whole new group of people that can now get involved in activism. Um, so all together, this is an interesting group because what do we have? We have journalists who can broadcast this message, this new set of ideas to a very wide audience. Human rights activists who are saying why precisely there should be a different set of ideas um, and technical experts which can really call into question the claims of techno-military force specifically um, and all of these ideas that well if you just spend more money it becomes more accurate and more useful um, well maybe not um, WikiLeaks then really emerges um, as the center of a global culture war um, and it's between these two things state secrecy versus an open society so there are different groups that emerge which favor one or the other governments mostly on the side of state secrecy um, a few others um, that kind of theore um, the theoretically against WikiLeaks um, and its ideological position, um, and also those for an open society. And of course, uh, Anonymous becomes a big group that ends up um, supporting WikiLeaks um, and its actions. What goes on here that we can say then is a victory for WikiLeaks in terms of this anti-war position? Well, there's actually quite a few different types of what we would call victories here. Um, the army comes out and admits that influence operations against the U.S. Army uh, may be conducted by a variety of domestic and foreign actors. So this is saying that domestic actors may change, may influence the operation of the American military. Um, that the idea that an anti-war movement could grow as a result of these leaks, very much possible. Hashtag WikiLeaks. I'm sure you're all familiar with hashtagging certain things on social media. Um, here, there's a, an interesting study that shows that what this one in particular did is it established a structure of leaders and followers, um, a structure that could actually go out into the world and conduct successful operations, could mount successful protests because it was organized. It was organized through this hashtag. Um, and of course, they all came to that hashtag in support of the position of uh, WikiLeaks and Assange. Amnesty International, I'm sure you've all heard of, a massive um, international NGO. They argue that Assange's prosecution is a punitive measure for exposing crimes. So a massive NGO, non-governmental organization, which comes out in favor of Assange, um, in favor of WikiLeaks. Another Council on American Islamic Relations. The only people who should face prosecution today are the war criminals that WikiLeaks exposed over 10 years. So together we see that we have quite a big coalition of interests which are working in favor of WikiLeaks and Assange. Steber and Bacall, I think this is probably the, one of the most important aspects of this anti-war position. So we have two former soldiers who were actually there on the ground when all this stuff happened. Um, primary sources, right? All of my history students in the room, must be a few of you here, right? Um, this is important, and it's quite a long letter. This is uh, probably the most in, important aspect, though. Um, they say the soldier in the video said your husband shouldn't have brought your children to the battle But we are acknowledging our responsibility for bringing the battle to your neighborhood and your family We did unto you what we would not want done to us We have asked our fellow veterans and service members to sign in support of this letter in other words Come together and help us create and build an anti-war movement significant <clears throat> um, 
overall then, what is this? It's a critique from within the structural reality of American foreign policy. This has come from the real world. This is not abstract rhetoric anymore, right? This is people that have actually been there, seen it, done it, unfortunately, um, in this case. Critique three, the undermining of claims to technological military force, which remember, smart warfare, moral warfare, faster, more accurate, all this sort of stuff. <clears throat> Lots more points worth mentioning. Um, Assange, he says, I believe if those killings were lawful under the rules of engagement, then the rule of engagement, then the rules of engagement are wrong, deeply wrong. The Reuters Baghdad bureau chief, what he did was 100% an act of truth telling, exposing to the world what the war in Iraq looks like and how the US military lied. Again, what it actually looks like, not what this moralistic rhetoric and this technical rhetoric also claims, um, but the reality of it. Um, and this is probably the best quote that I think really illustrates that from, again, one of the soldiers that responded on the ground, Ethan McCauld. I had never seen anybody shot by a 30 millimeter round before, and frankly, I don't want to ever see that again. It almost seemed unreal, like something out of a bad B horror movie. When these rounds hit you, they kind of explode. People with their heads half off, their insides hanging out of their bodies, limbs missing. The point being that the claims that war can be fought in a moral way, um, in a way that um, does away with human suffering, um, definitely not, not applicable here. So the, this idea of smart warfare and its media portrayals, very different versus the real consequences. We're talking physical and emotional harm. Um, to the civilian victims and the military personnel as well, um, right? We're not um, throwing, a, throwing the American military servicemen under the bus here. Um, we're saying that they are victims too uh, as a result of this stuff. Um, and overall, the evidence points to this, unfortunately, a normalization of the use of violence, which um, if you watch that full video, that collateral murder video, you will hear the, the normalization of violence. Um, this is an interesting historical comparison. <clears throat> Curtis LeMay, he was appointed as the first chief of the Strategic Air Command in October 1948. Um, the bomber squadron that would go around the world and drop nuclear bombs if need be. LeMay established a nuclear first strike policy against the Soviet Union. In other words, he had plans to conduct the first strike against the Russians. Um, that there could be a case, there could be a scenario where it would be legitimate for the United States to shoot first. The reaction to elites within the military in this case is very different to the reaction <coughs> that Julian Assange got for his revelations um, on the realities of war um, from political elites today. Admiral Daniel Galley. He said, leveling large cities has a tendency to alienate the inhabitants and does not create an atmosphere of international goodwill after the war. Rear Admiral Ralph Oste, LeMay's plan is ruthless and barbaric, contrary to the fundamental American ideals and would therefore be opposed by the American people on moral grounds. Um, we don't really see any examples of rhetoric like this from political elites vis-a-vis -vis Assange today. Um, the, the claim instead is that what he did was wrong, exposing this stuff was wrong, this is national security, so on and so forth. Another thing that WikiLeaks touches on is the use of drones, um, of course, which emerges and really becomes mainstream as a, an American foreign policy option under the Obama administration. Um, they are sold as a new, precise, moral, and accurate method of war. Um, we get some interesting cases that perhaps um, say otherwise. Um, there's a CIA leak that WikiLeaks publicizes um, that essentially says drones are use useless in Afghanistan. Um, yes, they can take out the leadership of the Taliban, but the Taliban replaces these guys as quick as we kill them. Um, so this is a, a waste of time, and we're not achieving anything with this use of this high-tech military force. 
Another leak shows that for Syria, the US government had kill lists, people, uh, 669 of them, including an American journalist, um, who were deemed to be worthy of um, execution um, from the air by the American government, um, judge, jury, and executioner just flying around uh, above in the air. <clears throat> Pakistan, this is an interesting case. Pakistan comes out publicly against the use of drones. These are violating our sovereignty. Um, th this, is, this is wrong. We don't want the US involved in any of this. Um, they're encroaching upon Pakistan as a free independent state. Privately, these leaks show that actually the Pakistani leadership was quite happy well, with some of the use of drones um, if they targeted the right people, quote, the right people. Um, yeah, the question kind of becomes, um, is there is there a right people to target with this sort of technology? Is this the right method of war? Um, perhaps not. Um, interestingly here, lessons learned. Um, and then I will wrap up. <clears throat> um, Thomson Reuters CEO, he sought wider public debate about what happened in the collateral murder incident. Um, and he wanted to press the need to learn lessons from this tragedy. Um, and I remember two of his employees killed uh, in that particular incident. Does this happen? <clears throat> Unfortunately not. Four examples. Um, the US Army, um, it, leaked, it uh, comes up with new rules for the unauthorized release or disclosure of classified or sensitive information. And it likens whistleblowers to criminals who may compromise the ability of the organization to accomplish its mission through espionage acts of terrorism and support to international terrorist organizations. Um, so leakers equated with terrorism in this new uh, regulation. Department of Defense, it goes more high tech, um, creates a hardened smart card system and increases um, access control to critical information. Um, so we really don't want this stuff getting out. Let's make more systems to ensure that it never happens again. Um, not more systems that are going to ensure that these tragedies do not happen again. More systems to ensure that this information doesn't get out. Interesting. <clears throat> Hillary Clinton, can't we just drone this guy? Assange, that is. <clears throat> um, yep, not, not too much of a lesson learned there. Um, Trump's CIA director, Mike Pompeo, brands WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence service. Um, what does this do? Legally widens what the CIA can do against WikiLeaks and what it can do against Assange um, when they're under this hostile classification. Um, so importantly also, these two points really allude to the fact that this is also a bipartisan position. Um, this is not a critique of the Republicans or the Democrats. This is a critique of um, kind of American foreign policy generally and the people behind it. And we see that they act in a unified fashion regardless of what party they are from. Um, this is one of the only real issues where that happens um, foreign policy. Um, so that about wraps up um, my argument. And I did leave you guys, if you so wish, a list of uh, books which you may want to look at and consult if you're interested in any of these issues or looking at American foreign policy in a very, in a very critical light. But otherwise, thank you for your attention and any questions I'd be happy to answer. And thank you. Yep. Yeah. It's just, I looked at the definition, the actual definition of terrorism, mm -hmm. and it says the unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians in the pursuit of political aims. Mm -hmm. So whistle, whistleblowers, like, for example, for Chelsea Manning, I don't think her intention was violent mm -hmm. to call her a terrorist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would agree, Asia. Yeah, I would agree. Um, yeah, terrorism is supposed to be the use of violence to achieve political aims, right? Um, leaking information, not necessarily the use of violence. And I'm sure she had a point across to basically help Americans, mm -hmm. not the opposite. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any questions, Claudia? Um, how much would you say the U.S. government and the, the military as an institution, how much separation would you say is in between them? Like how much autonomy does the military have mm -hmm. act on its own decisions that you, the generals mm -hmm. have to 
act and make decisions without necessarily having to completely inform the president mm -hmm. or act through like any branches like at all, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Um, far more than they would probably have you believe. Um, there's a, an interesting study, which I don't think I put on here. It's called Blank Check by a guy called Tim Weiner. And his argument is that the special forces, the army special forces, they came about as a result of the army essentially going off and doing its own thing. And it started conducting operations without any real official oversight. Um, turned out into quite a big scandal, how they got the money, they were reappropriating it from places that they shouldn't have been. Um, so yeah, this stuff absolutely goes on and there is a leeway to do it. Yep. How much uh, do you think the public eye has, how much of an effect do you think it has in regards to uh, I don't know, prosecuting people. I'm looking at people like Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, mm -hmm. and people are constantly watching this, and I'm looking at pe like someone like James O'Keefe, and yes, his house has been raided, and people are watching, and nothing has happened to this guy yet. No, mm -hmm. He hasn't been prosecuted, he hasn't been hooked up, but he hasn't been Clinton mm -hmm. or anything. He's still walking around. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think people actively watching and waiting is the reason he's still walking around? Yeah, I think um, the the degree of public support that you have is very important. Um, so they would like to try to, um, let's say, put this sort of opposition in, in a drawer and forget about it and lock it away somewhere, um, which you're kind of alluding to can happen to these individuals. Um, but yeah, if you have widespread public support and widespread public influence, it makes it harder for that to happen. Um, and in an ideal world, we would hope that something could be learnt from these individuals, right, and actually applied um, to change what's going on um, instead of um, political, economic, military forces working to curtail what's going on and wrap it all up and keep it um, locked away and kind of continue pressing onwards with their own ideals and their own goals about um, what should be going on in the world. So the public may have pull over this more than we thought we did? If it reaches a certain degree. Um, Gramsci, the, one of the uh, theoreticians who I mentioned at the start, he talks a lot about this. Um, and the whole idea is that if you reach kind of a critical mass of people in society, enough people that are interested in it, you can actually change um, how the ruling class operates. Um, but unless you reach that, you don't really have too much of a chance. And you'll have all of the intellectual forces of the ruling class working against you. Um, in overtime on some of these issues as well, as, as we kind of saw. Yep. What do you think the long-term effects are of the moralistic, <laughs> sorry, the moralistic veneer that you talked about? <laughs> um, it kind of depends how long that the moralistic veneer can be maintained. Um, I think it's, um, I think it was, Machiavelli kind of talks about this and he, he says that you need to maintain the idea that what you're doing is the right thing. Um, you need to maintain that for as long as you possibly can, um, otherwise you lose your grip on control and you have to resort to alternative methods. Um, so the whole idea of this moral veneer is to ensure that there is peaceful support of, of these ideas and of these positions um, without having to force people at the barrel of a gun to support you. Um, and in terms of how long it will last overall, um, for as long as these groups can maintain it, um, which they would like to maintain it forever, um, and the corporations that benefit from that $800 billion every year would not only like to maintain it, they'd like to um, grow it even further, right? And eventually at this rate, it will be hitting a trillion dollars. Um, in generally a time of peace, which is um, interesting. Um, the American people have never really gotten a peace dividend. Um, after the war has ended, they never really rolled back the uh, spending on military force. Um, other places did. Um, I talk about this with some of you guys in my class right now, um, the upper division class. The United Kingdom, for exa example, after World War II, really completely cut back on uh, military spending and gave back to the people in terms of social programs, um, spending on that instead. But yeah, never really happened in the United States. So there's always another crisis, always another emergency, seemingly. 
anyone else? Um, what do political figures gain in terms of supporting like elites uh, agendas or or do you think they are elites like mm -hmm. global political figures mm -hmm. yes yeah, so in terms of elites as an idea this means really someone that has access to institutional power that you and i do not so they have the ability to actually move the levers of power in their own um, direction um, and what they seek to achieve from that um, is a furthering of their own interests. This is really the thesis of C. Wright Mills in The Power Elite. Um, these people are there and they're trying to stay there. And they got there as a result of a coincidence of interests which emerged after World War II, specifically um, economic, military and political elites that all found themselves in this newfound position of power as a result of the end of World War II. Um, and then subsequently from that point, they all work together to maintain where they are. So maintenance of their position is really kind of the ultimate goal. Jonathan? Uh, kind of being that like we already live in like an extremely like polarized country as is, mm -hmm. if say like an anti-war movement did gather that supporters and was extremely successful, mm -hmm. do you think that would create more problems domestically than the problems that they're creating internationally? Um, or kind of what would be the effect of a strong anti-war movement mm -hmm. did successfully create? Yeah, I think... Um in an ideal world, if it was really successful, it would curtail at least the spending to a degree. Um, but in terms of how it would actually emerge and the sort of uh, impact that it may have, um, it's kind of hard to predict that sort of thing. There was somewhat of an anti-war movement that, it, that sprung up during the Bush years. Um, back in the UK, um, we had the biggest protest ever in British history against the war in Iraq but still the British were involved in the war. So there's things that go on in the foreign policy realm that can be harder to push back against than in the domestic realm. Um, this is an, an area that really is dominated by, as Stephen Walt rightly says, a foreign policy elite, uh, which is kind of called the blob. Um, they group that is really entrenched um, in furthering this militaristic pursuit of these policy choices. Um, so yeah, it's tougher in the realm of foreign policy, but it is possible, right? I wouldn't um, say don't bother just because it's hard. Um, but yeah, if, if a real movement emerged, the consequences domestically, I think would be um, interesting. Uh, it would be interesting to see if they went along partisan lines or not. Um, whether it's majority Republicans or majority Democrats that would come out in favor of it. Um, I would push for something that would be bipartisan. Um, if you really wanted to change the system, you'd need to be as bipartisan as the, um, the leadership is, right? Um, you can't just, uh, you can't be isolated. You can't be out on your own. Um, you, need to, you need a broad coalition that would stand against it. <clears throat> so hopefully that answers your question. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your Let's time. Give it a hand. <laughs> <laughs> <Appreciate it. laughs>